Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a pharmacist talking to a patient. Now read the question. Hi, I'm dropping off a new prescription. No problem, I have this in stock, but I do notice that this prescription is from the hospital. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, I was in the hospital for about 10 days. I need my refills as they didn't give me any new prescriptions in the hospital. I did have auto refills for you in the pharmacy. Unfortunately, I had to return it to stock since you weren't able to pick them up. But, if you give me 20 minutes, I can get them all ready for you. I twisted my ankle leaving the apartment this morning. It's hurting real bad. That's terrible, especially since it's your first day coming back from the hospital. But I did want to talk to you about one thing. The ibuprofen that you're holding, especially with your medical condition, will have a tendency to reduce blood flow to your kidneys. Really? They told me I couldn't take Tylenol, but I thought that ibuprofen would be okay. At the hospital, they said my kidneys weren't doing too good when I first got there. But when I left, they said everything was back to normal. Question 26. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about Nipah virus. Now read the question. Hello doctor, can you explain what the Nipah virus is? Well, Nipah virus is a member of the paramic severity genus Hennepah virus. This Nipah virus was initially identified and isolated in 1999 during an outbreak of encephalitis and respiratory problems among pig farmers and other people with close contact with pigs in Singapore and Malaysia. The name of the virus originated from Sungai Nipah, a village in Malaysia where pig farmers became sick with encephalitis. Initially, the disease was linked with Hendra virus, emerged from bats, but was quickly singled out for investigation and flying foxes of the genus were subsequently identified as the reservoir for the Nipah virus. Question 27. You hear a radiographer talking to a patient about her MRI scan. Now read the question. Come in, come in. Mrs. Brown, isn't it? My name's Ted, and I'm going to be doing your MRI scan today. Now, can you get up on the table for me? You know, I'm really claustrophobic. Well, this is a new piece of equipment. The diameter is much larger, so it should make it a little more comfortable for you. <clears throat> You'll also have this call bell, so if you need me at any point during the test, you squeeze that, okay? Okay. Now, your scan's only going to take about 15 minutes. Are you okay with that? Uh. I am. Okay, let's get started then. Question 28. You hear a nurse reporting to the doctor regarding a patient. Now read the question. Hi, Dr. Walker. Yes, this is Carolyn Hall. I'm calling um, concerning Virginia Woolf in 347B. She's a para one, gravita one, and she has a massive amount of bleeding that saturated that, that saturated her bed and is pooling on the floor. Yes, and right now she's unresponsive and her blood pressure is 86 over 40. Her heart rate is 122, her respirations is 12, and her O2 sat is 90% on room air. 
Yes, she had an un uncomplicated vaginal delivery this morning and we gave her some Percocet and Ambient about 90 minutes ago. She has a saline lock on her, in her right arm and it looks like a hemorrhage and I think you should come and assess the patient. Okay. Question 29. You hear a pharmacist talking to a doctor about a patient's medication. Now read the question. Uh, sorry to bother you, Dr. Anderson. I just wanted a quick word about Mrs. Campbell's prescription. The one for diphenhydramine that you gave her last week. Ah, yes, for her allergies. Yeah, so she's been taking 50 milligram tablets for about a week now. The thing is, she's just been into the pharmacy and she says that the tablets are making her feel really drowsy and her mouth's really dry ever since she started on the pills. Really? Well, that does happen from time to time. But uh, maybe switching her on to a different medication wouldn't be a bad idea. OK, I'll look into some options and then run them past you later, shall I? Fine, thanks. Question 30. You hear two doctors doing an activity at a staff training day. Now read the question. So, what did the trainer say we have to do? Well, we've got to look through these case notes, 10 sets in total, and decide which of the patients should be referred to the consultant as a matter of urgency and which can wait. Oh, right. And did I hear him say there's a limited number you can refer? Not exactly. He said that we should put them in rank order according to the severity of the symptoms and other factors evident from the case notes. Once we've agreed on our list, we have to go and compare with another pair of trainees. Okay. Let's get started then. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear a geriatrician called Dr. Claire Cox giving a presentation on the subject of end-of-life care for people with dementia. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. My name's Dr. Claire Cox. I'm a geriatrician specialising in palliative care. 
My topic today is an increasingly important issue, end-of-life care for dementia patients. The care of dementia patients presents certain problems. Dementia is a terminal illness and is the third highest cause of death in Australia. Different from other such conditions, it has an unpredictable trajectory and there can be difficult issues around patients' mental capacity, decision-making and communication. But, in spite of an equal need for palliative care services, dementia patients don't always fit the traditional model of such care. Families often suffer distress because they feel unable to ensure that their loved one's wishes are being respected, or just don't know what that person wanted because the discussion wasn't held early enough. There is therefore a clear need for well-funded, patient-centred palliative dementia care that's available when and where it's needed. I do a lot of work with Dementia Australia, an organisation which represents the needs of Australians living with all types of dementia and of their families and carers. It also campaigns on dementia issues and funds research. Dementia Australia decided it was the right time to examine the issue of end-of-life dementia care from the perspective of the consumer as well as from that of the healthcare professional. It's a timely initiative. We have plenty of anecdotal evidence but not enough hard facts about what's going wrong and why the system's failing. But the current situation isn't all bad. Despite the issues I've mentioned, I've heard some wonderful examples of how that has made a big difference to people's lives. Things can obviously go badly wrong if this isn't handled well. But in the right circumstances, people with dementia can reach the end of their lives peacefully and with dignity. Dementia Australia commissioned researchers to conduct a survey on the end-of-life issues affecting dementia patients. The survey covered both care professionals, that's doctors, nurses and others working with dementia patients, as well as family member carers. The interest was overwhelming with more than a thousand responses from around Australia. But what do the results tell us? Well, the initial results confirmed what we've heard about access to appropriate end-of-life care. It was obvious immediately that there was a between the perceptions of care professionals and family member carers about end-of-life dementia care. For instance, while 58% of family member carers said that they didn't have access to palliative care specialists and 68% didn't have access to hospices, three quarters of care professionals indicated that people with dementia in their area do in fact have access to palliative care. This begs the question of whether consumers, that is patients and family member carers, might not be aware of services that are available. Another notable finding of the survey was that care professionals often lack knowledge of the legal issues surrounding end-of-life care. Some reports indicate that care professionals are at times reluctant to use pain medications, such as morphine, because of concerns about hastening a patient's death. However, access to appropriate pain relief is considered to be a fundamental human right, even if death is earlier as a secondary effect of medication. Our survey found that 27% of care professionals were unsure about this or didn't believe that patients are legally entitled to adequate pain control if it might hasten death. So perhaps it isn't surprising then that a quarter of former family member carers felt that pain wasn't at This lack of awareness extends beyond pain management. The statistics on refusing treatment were particular. Almost a third of care professionals were unaware that people have the right to refuse food and hydration, and one in ten also thought refusal of antibiotics wasn't an option for patients in end-of-life care. How can we ever achieve consumer empowerment and consumer-directed care if the professionals are so ill-informed? There's a clear need for greater information and training on patients' rights. Yet over a third of care professionals said they hadn't received any such training at all.
It's obvious that end-of-life care planning is desirable. Discussing and documenting preferences is clearly the best way of minimising the burden of decision-making on carers and ensuring patients' wishes are respected. Advanced care planning is essentially an insurance policy that helps to protect our patients in case they lose their decision-making capacity. Even though a patient might believe that loved ones will have their best interests at heart, the evidence shows that such people aren't that good at knowing what decisions those they love would make on complex matters such as infection control and hydration. So before I go on to... Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the lecture given by a Dr. Aaron Broderick on the topic blood type classifications. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. The human body contains about 10 pints of blood depending on the size of the individual. However, the blood composition is not the same in each individual. This is what makes the different blood types. The best method of grouping of blood is the ABO system, although there are other groups. Within the ABO group, there are four major categories that are divided into eight common blood types. A, B, O, and AB. Blood consists of cells and a yellow liquid known as plasma. The group of blood depends on what each part of the blood contains. There are two main blood group systems, ABO antigens and rhesus antigens. These two antigens are used to classify blood types. Normally, viruses and bacteria carry an antigen. During an infection, the antigen marks them as a foreign substance to the body that are usually not found in the body. Most red blood cell antigens are protein molecules on the surface of red blood cells. White blood cells produce antibodies as an immune defense. These antibodies target antigens and attack the foreign substance. Cross-matching of blood types is very crucial because if a patient receives red blood cells with antigens that is not present in his body, then it will reject and attack the new red blood cells. The ABO blood grouping method is used to determine the different types of antigens in the red blood cells and antibodies in the plasma. This system and RHD antigen status determine the blood type that will match for a safe red blood cell transfusion. There are four ABO groups. In group A, the surface of the red blood cells contains A antigen and the plasma has anti-B antibody that would attack any foreign B antigen containing red blood cells. In group B, the surface of the red blood cells contains B antigen and the plasma has anti-A antibody that would attack any foreign A antigen containing red blood cells. 
in group AB, the red blood cells have both A and B antigens, but the plasma does not contain anti-A or anti-B antibodies. Patients with type AB can receive any ABO blood type. In group O, the plasma contains both types of anti-A and anti-B antibodies, but the surface of the red blood cells does not contain any A or B antigens. Having none of these A or B antigens means that they can be safely transfused to a person with any ABO blood type. Some red blood cells contain the Rh factor, which is also called RHD antigen. Therefore, recess grouping adds another dimension. In case the red blood cells contain the RHD antigen, they are RHD positive. If they do not contain RHD antigen, they are RHD negative. That means there are eight major blood types in the ABO slash RHD blood grouping system. For instance, in the US, 30% population are A positive, A plus. A negative occurs in 6% of people. There are only 9% of population with B positive, while B negative occurs in just 2% of the population. AB positive occurs in 4% of people and AB negative occurs in just 1% of people. O positive occurs in 39% of people while O negative occurs in just 9% of people. About 82% of the US population has RHD positive blood. O negative blood contains neither A or B or RHD antigens. Therefore, these red blood cells can be transfused to nearly all patients of any blood type. Group O negative is considered as the universal donor type. On the other hand, AB positive blood contains no anti-A or anti-B or RHD antibodies. Therefore, patients with this blood type can receive nearly any type of red blood cell transfusion. This type is referred to as the universal recipient type. In case a patient with group B antigen receives red blood cells from a person with group A antigen, their body will reject the transfusion. This is because patients with B antigen on their red blood cells have anti-A antibody in their plasma. The anti-A antibody in the plasma then attacks and destroys the A antigen donor red blood cells. During pregnancy, a mother may have a different RHD type to the fetus as the fetus can inherit a different blood group from the genes of the father. Therefore, a risk is involved if the mother is RHD negative and the fetus is RHD positive. A small amount of red blood cells from the fetus can enter the mother's bloodstream, resulting in creation of anti-RHD antibody in the plasma by the mother, which is known as sensitization. A problem will arise if this antibody then detects the foreign antigen in the blood cells of the fetus, and if they attack the red blood cells of the fetus as a defense mechanism, which can result in severe jaundice and brain damage if undetected. Therefore, an injection of anti-D immunoglobin G helps to prevent the production of this antibody in the mother and decrease the impact of a sensitizing event on the fetus. Anti-D immunoglobin G dosing is usually given at 24 weeks of the pregnancy and at times an additional dose during 34 weeks of pregnancy. The effect of anti-D immunoglobin G lasts up to 12 weeks. During blood test procedure, the patient's blood will be mixed with a variety of serum samples. Each serum sample consists of a different blood type with the clotting agent removed. Then, the reaction of the blood sample of the patient with the serum sample will be monitored. The antibodies in the serum will cause a different reaction in each one. For instance, if a reaction occurs when the blood sample is mixed with the serum consisting of blood type A, which contains anti-B antibody, the unknown blood type of the patient must be type B.